Okay. Ooh. Ooh. I am the ghost of testing past. Let me test addition. Two plus two. It works. Ooh. Ooh. I am the ghost of testing present. Not for me, manual testing. I have automated my tests. Here's my test code. I've chosen test cases, two plus two, two plus three. I've supplied expected results. Let me run my test code. Yes, no. Oh, on line six, my test case was wrong. I expected two plus three to return six, but I got five, of course. So when a test fails, I get information immediately. And I can run my test as often as I like. Ooh. Ooh. I am the ghost of testing future. Not for me. Care for individual test cases. No, no. I shall write general properties of my code, such as plus is commutative for all x and y, real numbers. x plus y is y plus x. Plus is associative. And I shall take my general properties and, whoops, ah, oh, there we are. And I shall call my testing tool, quick check, and check. Is plus commutative? Yes, a hundred tests say that it is. Is plus associative? No, it's not. If I take x to be 1, y to be 0.4, and z to be minus 1, the rounding errors are different on the two sides of the equation. And quick check will just produce the necessary test case for me. <laughs> OK, what was all that? <laughs> that was uh, the first couple of minutes of a talk I gave a couple of years ago at a, a workshop on the future of programming. I was talking on the future of testing. So what was I thinking? Why did I start the talk like that? Well. I started off with examples. I was very concrete. Examples are the best way to begin a talk. Resist the temptation to be abstract and general. People won't know what you're talking about. Show examples. Secondly, I got to run a demo of QuickCheck, the software that I was talking about. And demos are a very, very uh, powerful way of conveying um, your message. But what about the whoa stuff? What was that for? For show, of course. <laughs> and you might think, this is science. I don't have to put on a show. But I'm afraid you do. Sit at the back, look at people's screens. You can see what's on them. Email, Facebook, the newspaper. You've got to compete with that while you give a talk. And uh, if you lose your audience's attention, you will not get it back. So a talk is, above all, a performance. You may be a shy and retiring person, personally, but when you're on stage giving a talk, you are a performer. Give it all you've got. And don't be afraid to go over the top. Um, Phil Wadler, for example, loves to take... <laughs> his most important slide, and he draws it on a shirt. And then he wears that shirt with another shirt over it. And when he gets to that point in his talk, he <laughs> takes his shirt off, and there is the commuting diagram, or, or the typing rule, or whatever it is, on his chest. <laughs> Does he do that because you can read the diagram better on his chest than on the screen? <laughs> of course not. He does it for show. 
and for the shock value of seeing a distinguished professor start to strip off in front of you in the middle of a conference. <laughs> so, don't forget that your talk is a performance above all else. Okay, well, I, I think now it is about time, isn't it, for my outline slide. So, I'm going to start off by introducing the problem, as you see. Um, uh, first, I'll, I'll have the introduction of the talk, then I'll, I'll introduce the problem, then I'll talk about my solution, I'll show you some results, and then we'll have a discussion of my results and some related work. Finally, I'll conclude. <laughs> Did you learn anything from that? Of course not. I just waited, wasted one minute of my precious 30 on trivialities. And uh, you can actually waste much more than one minute on an outline slide. I've pe seen people waste a good five minutes when they've tried to give a little bit more detail about each of these steps. And it's useless. Why is it useless? Because there isn't time when you're presenting an outline slide to say enough about any of these points for people really to follow. So you're just wasting time. Don't do it. Take the outline slide out of your talk Get on with the meat instead. So you have to do that because time is very short in a talk. If you haven't given a 30-minute talk before, 30 minutes may feel like an ocean of time. But it's not. It's very, very hard to cram your message into that, that limited time. So because of that, you have to focus what you're going to talk about, and you have to cut mercilessly. One of the things that you might consider cutting, not everybody agrees with this, but one of the things you might cut is the related work section. Vital in a paper, not always necessary in a talk. It often doesn't justify its presence. Why? Because you don't have time to explain the related work properly. So you end up saying a few superficial things relating your work to a list of papers, and it becomes a laundry list. Not the best thing to spend your precious minutes on. So you have to be very, very focused um, but what should you focus on? What are you trying to achieve in a talk? Well, one thing you're not trying to do is to explain your paper in depth. There just isn't time to do that. The purpose of your talk is not to explain your paper. It's to sell it. You want people to walk out of the talk thinking, that was interesting. I should go and read the paper. And if they do that, you won. So, you have to sell your paper to your audience. Now, here's another point. Who are your audience? An audience is always a very mixed group of people. Don't make the mistake of trying to show the experts in the room how clever you are. Because if you do, you'll be talking to three people and wasting the time of the other 97. Explain your talk to the least knowledgeable members of your audience. Explain always too much rather than too little. And uh, if you do that, then you'll find that the experts will admire your beautiful explanations. It's much better in a talk to explain one interesting thing well, rather than many things superficially so that nobody really understands. So again, focus is critical. It's a good idea to ask yourself the question, if there's one thing that people should remember from my talk, what should it be? You want to know what the answer to that question is as you plan your talk. So you're going to need to introduce, of course, the problem that you're trying to solve. How should you introduce your problem to the audience? With an example. Um, the best way to introduce any such thing. But it's, it's not enough just to explain to the audience what problem you're trying to solve. You also have to explain why they should care. So, I said already that the purpose of a talk is to sell your paper to the audience. Well, maybe we can get some ideas from sales. Here's a book that I recommend if you want to change for computer science for a bit. This is the Bible of complex sales. This, this book is really extremely influential. Uh, it presents a method called spin selling. Spin is an acronym. It's situation, problem, implication, need payoff. I'm going to focus on the middle two. 
the problem and the implication. If you want to sell something to anybody, you have to convince them they have a problem that you can solve. But if you convince them there's a problem, and then you immediately show the solution, you risk the fact that they think, well, okay, I suppose that is a problem, but I don't really care about it. So before you go on to uh, try and sell your solution, you need to show the implication of the problem. Here's a slide from a, a talk that I've given quite often. This is about a bug we found with QuickCheck in a CAN bus stack from a vendor. The CAN bus is a network that is used very, very heavily in cars. And when you send a message on the CAN bus, it always has a priority. The smaller the number, the higher the priority. So in this test case, <coughs> we start off by sending a message with priority one, and that goes immediately onto the bus. Now the bus is busy. Then the test case sends messages with priorities two and three. They have to be queued up because the bus is busy. The final step of the test case is normally called by the bus driver, and it confirms that the bus has finished sending message number one. So now, the CAN bus stack can choose another message to send. It should send the message with priority two, because that's the smallest number. The code we were testing sent the message with priority three. Okay, so, so from what I've said so far, you can see that that's wrong behavior. But, hey, it's, it's only one message different, only one priority level, does it matter? Well, almost everything in a car talks on a CAN bus. The stereo, the brakes. Here's a tip, don't adjust the volume during emergency braking. <laughs> you see what I did? I turned a technical problem with inverted priorities into a question of life or death. You need to do that kind of thing to persuade the audience that your problem is important. Okay, um, let's talk about slides. Has anybody seen a talk with a slide like this in it? <laughs> yeah? Or this? It's part of the notes of this very talk, actually. Or this? Yeah, you may see one or two of these this week. It's amazing how often when somebody puts a slide like this up, that the next thing they say is, most of these rules are standard. <laughs> the one I wanted to look at is this one. If this is the rule we're supposed to read, this is the only rule that should be on the slide. Don't put anything on your slides that you don't want the audience to read. It'll only serve to distract them from what you're saying. And while we're on the subject of slides, you in the back row, how many of you can easily read that text box? Five people? Yeah. This is the default font size that PowerPoint uses when you create a text box. Now, maybe you're thinking, oh, oh, oh I use Keynote. <laughs> They're just as bad as each other. So, presentation software like PowerPoint, it's really designed for giving a talk to a small number of people in a small room. There you can get away with a font that size. But conferences like this are usually given in ballrooms, rather like this one, with not very high ceilings. Look at the size of the screen. You've got one just as big as this in your little meeting room back home. So the screen ends up being very small and for many people in the audience, very distant. People will not be able to read your slides unless you enlarge the fonts well beyond the default size. That's very, very important. There's nothing more frustrating than sitting at the back and not even being able to read what's on the slides. Let me show you a few slides from the keynote I gave at ICFP some years ago. This was the estimated cost to the US economy of software errors in 2002. This was an estimate of the turnover of the US software industry around about the same time. So if we just assume back of the envelope that if that's the turnover, maybe they spent 120 billion on developing software. This is the average percentage of cost of a software project that is spent on testing. So now we can see that the money spent in the US on testing is more or less the same as the cost to society of the residual errors. 
And that, that's really very important. It tells us as researchers that um, if we're proposing alternative methods of fixing bugs in software, they better not cost more than twice as much as testing, because if they do, they'll never be used, because they won't pay off. So that was the message from my ICFP talk. I could, of course, have presented the same material like this. You may well have seen similar material presented in this kind of way. Um, but it would have had a lot less impact. So your slides are not your teleprompter. Don't forget that. It's tempting when you're inexperienced to try and write enough on the slides that if you forget what you're going to see, say, you can just read from the slide. But don't do it. Plan to talk about the slides, not to read what's on them. By the way, there's another way I could have presented this. I could have said, software errors cost the US economy 60 billion a year. The turnover of the software industry is about 240 billion a year. Are you annoyed yet? <laughs> it's very, very irritating, isn't it? You still see people do it, though. So that's a very bad use of animation. You shouldn't use animation in that way where, where you're making the medium show more than the message. Uh, use animations to do things like show the differences between two slides or to draw people's attention to something you want to talk about. Here's a slide I've used to talk about testing a 3G radio base station. Um, base stations maintain radio channels to each phone that is actively communicating. But normally, for each phone that's actively in, in use, there are a lot of phones sitting in pockets. And there aren't enough radio channels in the frequency spectrum for a base station to have a dedicated channel to each phone in its cell. So instead, there is one signaling channel that goes from a base station to all of the inactive handsets. Although there's only one, it still has to be set up. And so the protocol for controlling a base station has a command you can send that says set up that signaling channel and use this frequency and this power and so on. And the base station will say, OK, I've done it. Now, of course, since that message is in the protocol, it's possible to send it twice. But that's stupid. There's only supposed to be one signaling channel. So the base station should, of course, say, no, I've got my signaling channel already. Well, Quick Check generated this test case and found just the right combination of parameters in those two calls to set up to make the base station say, OK. And now, the base station had two signaling channels, breaking a fundamental invariant of the software, and it fell over, and we could get no more out of the base station without rebooting it, which took two minutes. So um, there, you see that I've used animations to direct your attention to different parts of the slide. Uh, something else you can do, of course, is point with your arm. That's good. If you can't reach something up the top, Jump! Uh, jumping around and moving actively, it helps keep people's attention. So don't worry about that. If you have a big stick, you can reach even higher up. That's good. I would not recommend using a laser pointer. That's because they're difficult to use well. They're difficult to aim accurately. They're difficult to hold steady. What often happens is you see a red dot dancing around the screen a bit, and you wonder, what was I supposed to look at? So uh, that's a bit of a trap. If you're going to be speaking in a room with a very large screen and you can't reach the top of the screen, but you want to point at something there, prepare an animation on the slide, a little arrow that just appears and goes away again. So if you are prepared, then you can cope with that kind of problem. How am I doing for time? OK. Um, let's say a little bit about. Um, Now, let me see where I'm going. Um, let me say a little bit about nerves. You may well be nervous the first time that you give a talk to a large audience. Um, I can't honestly claim to be nervous anymore. I've done it so much. But I do get a lot of adrenaline, and so will you. That's good. Adrenaline is there to give you energy. Right? The fight or flight instinct. Use the energy. Run to the screen. Jump. Let the audience see your passion for your material. And they will appreciate that. 
So that, that can be a plus. Remember, above all, you're giving a performance. Don't let nerves get in the way. Give 100%, and then afterwards, you can feel nervous. One thing that um, I find helpful, and you may well find helpful, is to prepare a script. Uh, now, that can mean that if you uh, are trying to remember, OK, what did I mean to say next? You can look at the script and get that. Don't try to write down everything you're going to say, or you'll be trying to find, you know, where, where am I? That's no good. What you want is something that you can have lying on the table and just glance at and read easily. So you need to print something in a very large font, just bullet points. Um, you may find it helpful, uh, I do, to plan some phrases that you will use during a talk. Let me give you an example of that. Um, a couple of years ago at ICFP, two of my colleagues weren't able to turn up to present their paper, so I ended up having to do it. I had to give a talk about parallel parsing. That's what the paper was about. And there was a subtlety towards the end of the talk. It turns out that the very hardest thing to parse in parallel is a sequence. <laughs> Why? Because the natural abstract syntax tree would be a list. And a list is a very sequential data structure. It's very bad for parallelism. So what's the solution? Well, the solution is not to parse the sequence by you know, an element followed by the rest, but just parse two sub-sequences of the same length so that you gradually build up a balanced binary parse tree. Parallel, lovely. Now, you might suspect it's not quite as easy as it looks. After all, how are you going to decide where to split the input before you've parsed it? And actually, the solution to this problem was the trickiest part of the whole paper. Uh, it, remember, it wasn't my paper. I had to read that section many times before I understood it. And I wanted to convey this to the audience, but I knew it was coming at the end of the talk with very little time left. So I thought, what can I say? So what I said was, this looks easy. It's not. <laughs> read the paper. That's quite a memorable phrase. It's not one that came to me on the spur of the moment. It's a phrase that I had planned to use. It was in my notes. You may find it helpful to plan key phrases like that without writing down everything you're going to say. If you're speaking in a language that is not your native language, then it's especially important to plan more of the phrases. When I speak in give technical talks in Swedish, then I have more of the sentences planned before I actually give the talk. OK, uh, what else can you do to cope with nerves? Well, rehearse the talk. This may sound obvious. But rehearse it to yourself over and over and over. And time it so you know how long it's going to take. If it's going to be too long, cut. It's much better that you cut in advance than that your chairman cuts you off at the end of your slot. And if you've rehearsed the talk enough times, then by the time you come and stand in front of everybody to give it, it's going to be second nature. And nerves will not affect you to the same extent. So I said that if there was one thing that people should remember from your talk, you should know what it was. But I have three things I want you to remember from this talk. So the first one is, be concrete, use examples. The second one is, don't put too much on your slides. And the third one is, put on a good show. And if you do those three things, and I will look forward to listening to you speak. Thank you. I'm not sure I really agree with that. I think if your talk has good flow, as Derek was saying when he was talking about writing a paper, your audience will follow along anyway. Okay, I suppose I did have an outline slide for this talk, but I didn't really follow it. 
And I hope that you followed along with me anyway. It's important to be entertaining. But um, yes, I actually don't find it to be a problem. Uh, I think you, the audience must never wonder, why is she telling me this? <laughs> right, but if you have a good flow to your story, I think you can tell a story without having a, you know, now we're in chapter three. I, I just don't think that is important to spend time on. Yeah. By the way, this was a very hard talk to give and to prepare because you know when you give a talk about how to give a talk, if you do anything wrong, <laughs> the audience is going to be on you. So I had, when I first gave this talk, uh, I spent a long time wondering how will I give it? You know, what points will I pick to talk about? And then I realized the right way to give this talk is to show you examples. That's what I did. I started with an example and I showed you several more throughout the talk of my own slides, how I'd solve problems in my own talks, and, and I hope that that has conveyed my message. Did I answer your question? Maybe not. Uh, it was more of a comment. Okay. Well, maybe I summarized three of the most important points. And when you get to the end, right, the, the problem with an outline slide is you're trying to talk about something you haven't described yet. And so people try and imagine what you're talking about, but they don't really know. Yes, there we are. It's a violation of old and new, exactly. When you get to the end, you've already given the talk, and just summarizing things you have talked about, you're not going to lose people in the same way. I did, yes. You can't bring people back. <laughs> Once somebody has missed a couple of minutes of your talk, they will never rejoin you. So if there's a part of your talk where you think maybe only 30% of the audience will follow it, cut it out. Much better to explain the other material well enough that everybody follows than to plan to lose people for a part of the talk. I would never do that. Um, so I've got a presenter display here, and I find it quite useful. Um, is the projector widescreen? No. Uh, I have no particular views on that. Tell him John Hughes says you're right. <laughs> so people don't wake up and rejoin the talk. It just doesn't happen. Don't worry about that. So there is an issue, uh, a similar issue, when you give uh, lectures on courses to students, because quite often you might want to give them some, some kind of notes, and the slides may play that role as well. But that forces a compromise. And when you're speaking at a meeting like this, the priority for me is the people in the room right now. 
and I will not compromise anything else to worsen that experience. Well, it is even more important to be extremely well prepared and to rehearse the talk many times. I mean, what can happen in a language you're not, that's not your own is that you get to a certain point and you forget the word for something. And then you're going to be standing there trying to recall what, I don't know, a tire pressure meter is in Swedish or something like that. <laughs> um, but practice can solve that problem. And again, well, the more I practice the talk, the more I plan exactly how I'm going to say each thing. And there could be some sentences that are just a bit harder to construct. You want to plan those in advance. But planning and practice is, I think, my solution to that. I've done it on a few occasions when I've given a fairly high-profile talk for the university in Swedish. And, well, yeah, I, more practice, more adrenaline. But it works. All right. Thank you very much, John. Okay. Thank you.